Hey guys, uh, my name is Amjad, and I'm from FX Labs. Uh, my co-founder Intisar was supposed to join, but he couldn't make it. And today I'll be covering best practices for API design to make your apps uh, secure, scalable, and efficient. So just wanted to give you a timeline uh, just to uh, go over uh, the origins uh, of how we came about with the FX Labs kind of uh, idea. And uh, Intasar and I have known each other for over eight years. We actually met at VMware in 2012. Uh, we were both part of the management business unit working on their cloud automation platform. And then in 2015, uh, we co-founded DCHQ, which was uh, a next generation cloud management and container orchestration platform uh, that was acquired in 2016. And uh, a lot of our customers used uh, containers for the same kind of reason that was you know, extensively covered in this conference, uh, you know, microservices in production, deployment agility, app portability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but few of our larger enterprise customers uh, we're actually using containers to uh, bring efficiency to test execution. And there was one particular customer, uh, they built insurance software. They're uh, one of the more prominent the players in that industry. And they had this big monolithic Java app, and their end-to-end -end, uh, integration test cycle would take more than five hours to complete. And as you guys can imagine, with DevOps on the rise and this company trying to be more agile, uh, the developer check-ins were happening much more frequently. And all of a sudden, you know, this end-to-end -end test cycle became the, the, their biggest bottleneck. So they came to us and they said, we want to use your container orchestration platform uh, to parallelize the test execution, uh, partly because uh, containers are much easier to sort of spin up and down. Uh, but they ultimately also wanted to uh, achieve uh, bigger savings in terms of infrastructure costs because each time they were running these test executions, it was costing them a, a whole lot of money um, to do that. Sorry about that. Um, so test execution uh, quickly became kind of uh, something that got stuck in our minds in, in terms of uh, a key sort of issue that uh, a lot of customers face. And, you know, that's partly why we started FX Labs. So if you look at testing, uh, you know, execution is definitely one of the problems. Uh, but the test creation itself is also another challenge. Um, a lot of companies struggle with the automation code that's very hard to maintain and debug. And when that person leaves, somebody else has to inherit that code and figure out what they're actually testing. And then a lot of the companies uh, that are developing software really have security as sort of the last priority as, as part of that initial design and uh, development phase. And they often rely on these periodic manual security audits that are very expensive. They catch issues very late in the game. And most importantly, uh, they don't detect these API-specific vulnerabilities. And that's what we're doing at FX Labs. What we do is we provide you with instant security coverage for your APIs. We introspect your uh, open API spec generate a whole bunch of security tests to uh, run them continuously and give you continuous compliance. Um, and then we also uh, bring a lot of efficiency to the test creation. Uh, so we have this test composition framework uh, that allows you to create data-driven tests uh, and simple YAML files. So no more automation code, uh, but with the test composition uh, supports like API chaining and data injection. So you can do a lot of the end-to-end -end testing. So uh, today, I'll just quickly go over some of the API best practices, you know, microservices, which has been extensively covered in this conference, and then talk about some security principles that should be applied in er as early as possible in the uh, design phase. Uh, so as far as API design, I'm, I'm not going to go through a lot of the common knowledge stuff. Um, you know, obviously, uh, using nouns instead of verbs. Uh, unless you have actual actions uh, like log out or you know convert temperature, uh, use plural nouns. Uh, so in, in this case, it's cars, not car. Um, you know, avoid these weird plural nouns like people. Use persons instead of people. Uh, always think about you know saying you know the use case where you're saying you know the tenth person completed this request as opposed to tenth people, right? Uh, 
uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, goose instead of geese, and you know, you know these plural nouns. Um, and yeah, just to go over this like common convention, like uh, in this case, if you do a get um, for all cars, you'll get you know the list of all cars. Otherwise, you if you specify the ID, you get that specific car. Uh, for post, if you want to create a new record, uh, you do it at the cars level. Obviously, you can't do it uh, with a, a, a pre-existing ID because that's automatically generated. Uh, if you want to update records, you can update a whole list of cars or you can update a specific one. And the same thing goes for delete, right? Uh, error handling is extremely important. And uh, it's also important from a security perspective, uh, specifically for the 500 status code. Um, you have to be very, very careful not to sort of uh, just dump your entire stack trace uh, when uh, an internal server error happens. Uh, otherwise, you're giving hackers the opportunity to sort of reverse engineer and figure out what, how your application is actually working. Um, but at the same time, uh, you, know, you also have to think of your, your end users and make, uh, provide payloads that are uh, somewhat uh, you know, helpful for the, your end users to figure out why an error happened, right? So a good example would be you know, the 403 uh, forbidden error. Uh, this is uh, an example where uh, you know, the authentication was successful, but that specific request was forbidden. And it can be somewhat frustrating for users uh, to sort of get that kind of error without understanding why it was forbidden. Uh, and so you can include things in the payload that would say you, know, um, you don't have enough credit to complete this transaction, right? Uh, as far as microservices, I, I don't want to dive too deep into this uh, topic. I think it's been covered quite extensively. Uh, I had a, a couple of other slides, but I kind of, um, once I attended some of the sessions in this conference, decided to just keep it to one slide. Uh, in general, you know, monolithic uh, code bases are much easier to get started with. Uh, they're easier to test. Uh, but the problem hap starts happening when the code base starts sort of exponentially growing. Uh, whereas microservices are uh, sort of better architected for sort of long-term scalability, but they have their own issues in terms of, um, you know, not being able to sort of uh, test as easily uh, just because, you know, yesterday some of the questions I was hearing was about you know linking microservices and how do you go about figuring out like these loose dependencies um, with monolith you know that problem doesn't exist because you sort of understand all the dependencies um, you know all at once uh, but of course from a release perspective you know if the monolith code base becomes so huge as was happening with the uh, you know that insurance software company we were working with then you know obviously making one feature update. Uh, becomes such a hassle because it has so many dependencies and then that end-to-end -end testing cycle has to happen uh, just to push one simple update whereas with microservices you can make updates at the speed of you know the changing business requirements uh, so right now I'm kind of gonna shift gears and talk about some of the security principles that should be applied in the API design phase and I'm only going to focus on like a couple of examples. Obviously, there's a lot more. Uh, one specific example that I'm going to start with is uh, pagination. So you know, sort, sorting, filtering, pagination is all kind of embedded into the in the app design uh, in the early stage sort of development cycle. Um, but it's very very critical to think about you know the some of the design implications, uh, the implications of the design on, on you know, security, right? So in, in this case, you, know, you absolutely must have limits in terms of pagination. Otherwise, you're opening the door for a terrible sort of DDoS kind of attack vulnerability where um, you know, uh, users can actually request thousands and you know, millions of pages at once and try to sort of overload your system and bring it down. And m many different kind of uh, pagination techniques, you know, honestly, nobody cares how you do it as long as it's there. Um, you know, the offset pagination, um, you know, limit and offset um, are now sort of supported in most SQL databases and can be included in the SQL select uh, syntax. Uh, so the example here is like get items limit equals 20 and you get 20 items um, at a time. 
Uh, other types include, you know, key set pagination and seek pagination. Uh, but, you know, obviously just make sure that you enforce these limits. Uh, the, the other example that seems to be causing more issues uh, for our customers is just in terms of uh, RBAC and identity governance in general, right? Um, so, you know, the, the you know, how, how many people in the audience use RBAC today in their application? Cool. So, you know, the, uh, obviously basic idea of RBAC is that you have these uh, permissions uh, grouped in, into roles and uh, the problems start happening is when, you know, multiple roles can be assigned to that same user. And, you know, the identity management solutions out there, including, you know, Curity, obviously, uh, the, we we're partnering with Auth0 back in the U.S., uh, Okta. These are all fantastic technologies. They sort of uh, take the pain of user management and, uh, you know, authentication, authorization, role, uh, assigning roles to users. They t take all that kind of pain and, um, and do that for you, right? But the problem starts happening in the actual implementation and maintenance uh, of these things because at the end of the day, there's an admin who is kind of assigning roles to users and businesses continuously keep changing these roles to assign different permissions. And unless you have the proper testing and checks and balances to make sure that every user who's assigned the role is actually given that role um, for a purpose and is supposed to get that role, uh, then you're you know putting yourself at risk essentially and you know most of the major security vulnerabilities happening today whether it's at facebook and google plus it all boils down to an authenticated user um, getting access to some sensitive information that he or she should not have been able to get uh, it's never it's rarely an you know a, a, a user that, that's not authenticated it's somebody who's already in the system and they're able to get access to some information. And so the problem ha starts happening with RBAC specifically when you have like an explosion of roles and you know that your user base continues to grow exponentially. And that's why we are preaching, you know, uh, a continuous testing of these RBAC tests. And you know, luckily with our, our platform, we actually auto-generate these RBAC tests for you um, based on your open API set, spec and roles. And so you can continuously run them to make sure that uh, you don't have any vulnerabilities there. Uh, just uh, in general, some best practices for API testing. Uh, have some kind of standardization in terms of how you write the tests. Uh, you know, the problem with automation code is that at the end of the day, it is code and it's very hard to sort of maintain and debug. Uh, uh, but if you use like a standard markup language, you can enforce standardization. It makes it easier for the next person uh, who's collaborating or who's sort of going to own those tests to be able to contribute. Uh, definitely look for you know data-driven testing approaches where you're able to reuse uh, the data sets for different tests. Uh, start thinking about distributed uh, test execution from the beginning. Uh, you know, the oftentimes we see customers starting with a basic implementation of Jenkins not like master-slave implementation. And as their number of tests keeps growing, you know, Jenkins becomes that bottleneck where it's not able to sort of execute these tests um, in an efficient way. Uh, bug management has to be somewhat automated. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of bugs associated with all the failures happening with your tests. And then most importantly, include security coverage, include security um, in, in your er, at the earliest point in the development cycle. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people have been talking about shift left testing, and that's mainly because the cost of a bug continues to increase exponentially the later you find it. And, you know, uh, obviously this chart shows that, you know, the, the later you find a bug, the more expensive it is to uh, fix it. Uh, whereas if you move to the left and uh, you know, move the testing uh, to to the earliest at the, at the earliest point in the development cycle. Then, fixing an issue becomes very seamless and, and efficient. Uh, I mean, think of it this way: you're writing code. Is it easier for you to fix uh, an issue uh, when the code is fresh in your mind within like a few days, or uh, 
when you discover it like days, weeks, or months later, right? Um, when, when the number of dependencies sort of grow and it becomes much, much harder to fix a bug. Uh, and so the, this concept definitely applies to security. Um, this, you know, with quality bugs, uh, it's like that cost is actually bounded. Uh, but for security, that cost is actually unbounded because you may have a security vulnerability that can actually uh, cause your entire business to sort of shut down and, uh, you know, 60% of startups actually um, actually end up f being forced to shut down within like six months of having a major security breach, right? So it's very, very important to include security as at the earliest point of your development cycle, right? Uh, this is an example of what happened to uh, GitLab uh, this is a specific API vulnerability that was announced, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they had an events API uh, that was basically uh, exposing sort of con confidential data about uh, private events, uh, but in public projects, right? So the projects themselves were public, but the events were private, and the events API was exposing that uh, sort of sensitive data. Uh, the problem is that... Uh, this issue was discovered a year and a half later uh, by a hacker from HackerOne. Uh, they do like these bug bounty programs. And I think it was like accidentally or just like randomly sort of discovered. And the problem is not really just with the security consequences, but also with the uh, cost of fixing. Because now, a year and a half later, guess how many third party developers and integrators have have been using the events API and uh, the cost of fixing this will now be sort of, uh, you know, much, much larger because they have to notify everybody and they have no idea how people have been using this API and there's a lot of different implications. So moral of the story is that you have to have uh, more comprehensive and continuous testing at the earliest, um, you know, stages of your development cycle and not really rely on these security audits or bug bounty programs to just discover things for you. Uh, these are common API vulnerabilities. We already covered the first two, you know, injections, obviously the third big one. And, you know, honestly, a lot of the security tools out there kind of uh, help you prevent a lot of the SQL injection stuff. Uh, but the first two are really the ones that kind of uh, attack the API layer specifically and uh, that you definitely need to have uh, good coverage for. Uh, the yeah, cost of a data breach uh, continues to grow. Uh, so this is based on like data from um, this research uh, inst institute. And you know the problem is that you know a major security breach can cause like 60% of startups get go out of business within six months of a major security breach. Uh, but the good news is that 89% uh, of these breaches could have been, been prevented, right? So yeah, uh, just high level overview of FX Labs. Uh, we provide you with instant security coverage. So based on your open API spec, we'll generate a whole bunch of security tests across various security categories like DDoS, log, uh, injections, RBAC, ABAC, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also create your own uh, data-driven tests and simple files to test your end-to-end -end API flows. And we support API chaining and data injection and so on and so forth. And then you can run these tests from, uh, we have, I think, more than uh, 35 plus regions across the globe. Or you can provision your own test bots within your own private cloud or on your local machine. Uh, and then we aggregate the results, give you detailed analytics, wire logs um, to sort of pinpoint the issue and then uh, automate the bug filing and fixing. Uh, so that's it from my side. And ping me if you are interested in learning more.